Hello and welcome to the Father's House. Um, when I was asked to um, speak, um, just a little bit and do communion, um, I had two things come to mind. Um, one thing um, was, like a testimony, you could say, um, something that's been going on in, in our lives in the last few months. And um, that is that for quite a while we've been, you could say years even, that we've been going through a hard time. And um, we've always, or we lived a long, a long time in the Hills District and uh, moving to the mountains, uh, it's even more hillier. So, but part of the thing I wanted to talk, just briefly mention that was we'd always seen ourselves on a hard road going up and it's always harder going up than it is going down. But we, we feel that now we've come to the, the, the top of the mountain or the top of the hill and now we're going down. The unfortunate side of that is that going down is easy and shorter. And then we're going to come to a valley and then there's another hill. But anyway, that's something we need to uh, just enjoy for now. And there's, I know there's others in this congregation who are in different stages, but, you know, um, I believe some of you are, are coming down the mountain with us and some of you are going up the mountain. So just, just a reminder is that, you know, when you get to the top, you always get the easy bit after to go down, OK? Um, the other thing was, an old, it's interesting tonight we had a, an old hymn as uh, the last song and the other thing that came to mind was, um, um, on, on, um, was an old hymn and I thought, where'd this come from? I, I haven't sung that since I was a little, little boy. And um, when we, we have communion, we're always celebrating or we're always using the bread and the wine to remember that what Jesus did and his sacrifice, but also he said to do it in remembrance of me until I come. And I just wanted to read the parts from this hymn. Excuse me. Jesus may come today, glad day, glad day, and I would see my friend. Dangers and troubles would end if Jesus could... Jesus should come today. I may go home, go home today, glad day, glad day. See me if I hear their song. How to the ra radiant throng, if I should go home today. Why should I be anxious be, glad day, glad day. Lights appear on the shore. Storms will affright nevermore, for he is at hand today. Faithful I'll be today, glad day, glad day, and I will freely tell why I should love him so well, for he is my all today. And the chorus is, glad day, glad day, this is the crowning day. I live for today, nor anxious be. Jesus, my Lord, I soon shall see. Glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? So just please remember... Um, We've got something to look forward to as we take the, the bread and the wine. I want to worship you like David did. I want to sit at your feet like Mary did. And I want to see you face to face.
I'm going to talk about hope deferred and hope fulfilled tonight. One of the things, um, uh, you know, often I'll share bits of my testimony because I've got an amazing testimony. It's amazing. And when I think about it, uh, we went out um, this week on Friday to see my son, uh, one of my sons, graduate as a corrections officer. And we sat in this big tent and they marched around. We had a brass band near us. I'm not an aficionado of brass band music, generally speaking. It's a sort of an acquired taste. But I, I, I and uh, my son pledged loyalty to the king, which was really a strange thing too. Um, but I thought about how far God had brought his life. And now, rather than my life be an influence on him, although it is, his life's also an influence on me. And once when um, everybody would have given up hope on him, we didn't. And we have seen God fulfil our hope in him. And he's turned into a, a fine man. But... My own testimony, of which I would have given away literally thousands of copies. Um, when I used to sell CDs, I've sold more than 10,000 CDs. That's a lot, isn't it? Can't be my mother, she's passed on. And, and what, one thing was that my testimony was always called Rivers of Hope. Because I would say to you, the thing that happened in my encounter with God, that one and others since, is that they have always been attached to or enveloped by great hope. And it's almost like hope was planted within me as, as a seed. Because I was told that I would never work again. In fact, I was told I would never, ever get out of a mental hospital. So here I am. Some people agree with the doctor's diagnosis, but it hasn't been true <laughs> because here we are. And, and hope's, hope's a very, very finite thing because the first thing the enemy will come after is your hope. He'll try to steal your hope and he'll tell you, are hopeless. What you've done is hopeless. What you've done is unforgivable. You'll always be lonely. You'll never be happy. You'll never be able to pay your bills. You'll never be able to find people who really love you. And constantly there'll be, there'll be an attack upon you that will that will um, that will uh, change the way you look at life. And in Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when hope or desire comes, it is the tree of life. Now, a lot of people are looking outside and they can't see a tree of life in their life. They see sticks or they see um, seeds that have failed. And see, here we are in a society where half the marriages don't make it. That's a, that's a lot of broken dreams, isn't it? And you might say, well, they must be non-Christian marriages. Oh, no, 51% of Christian marriages don't make it. So it's slightly more Christian marriages don't make it. I don't know why that would be so. But people walk down the aisle. I guess they have a wedding planner. Uh, we just we just did a wedding up at a surf club, which was um, uh, for Katrina Harrison now. And at that wedding, you know, the various members of the family made the cake or made something, plates of food. Uh, someone helped to uh, find a dress. Someone helped to do this. Someone helped to do that. And so there's a lot of people in that situation that are invested in that marriage, that 
attend that marriage with great hope. Yet we know that sometimes they don't make it. And I think one of the top functions of the Christian church is teach people and encourage people to seek the healing that they need so that they can have a strong marriage. So that we can teach people how to forgive. That would be good, wouldn't it? If we could forgive. And, and so many people sit in a church a lot of their life with hope deferred. They had expectations. When people led me to Christ years ago, they lied to me about how easy my life was going to be. And almost like becoming a Christian, Bob, was like meeting Santa Claus. But it said that the rich young man was, had to sell all his possessions to buy the field. And in that field are some strange critters. And we spend our, spend our life, don't we, with a lot of strange critters in our life that we know on a deep level that we're meant to love people but on that same deep level, we are, we are challenged with our own inability to love people or our own unwillingness to love people or to love people that are like us. And one of the great challenges, I think, of the Christian church is we like to surround ourselves with same people of the same beliefs so that we don't have any argument. But one thing that the uh, pandemic has shown us that people have got wild, widely different beliefs. And um, not always kindly communicated. So we find ourselves looking for hope. Because when we find hope, we find him. We sing songs today about the blood of Jesus. Now, when you break that down, that's an unusual thing to be singing about, isn't it? Oh, precious is the blood. When um, I became a Christian, I found myself in the company of many people who were coming out of various sorts of mental illness. And I could say universally that they were very, very kind to me. Very tender. Because when people say, I know how you feel, if they don't, it's pointless, isn't it? Just a throwaway line. But when you see people like Jacob walking with a limp, you say, they know. They know what I'm talking about. And so when they say, I know how you feel, Say so, yes. And when I began to um, find healing and it was a source of profound encounters in the, in the midst of tears and suffering and all of that, but I could say that I'm a man full of hope. I'm full of hope. Because I only have to review where God has brought me, what I faced when I... Look at my, my dear wife, you know, and see that we've put in 53 years together. That's a long time. That's a long time. But we didn't do that by not work. We, we haven't been able to do that with no work. We haven't been able to do that without no, any acceptance for a different opinion. We haven't been able to do that without some tension at times between us. Because as you come to one mind with somebody, it's not easy. And when you come, as the scripture says, we have the mind of Christ. We've had to go on a journey to get the mind of Christ. And that, that, that journey goes on and on and on. You see, hope makes the entrepreneur 
reach out for something more than he's got. When we, um, a man in America retired and when he got his first pension check or welfare check, whatever they call it, he realised he couldn't manage on that money. And he asked himself, what do I know? And what he realised was the only thing he had was he had a chicken recipe that people loved. And so he went out to different places with a unique way of marketing. And he had to prepare chicken for 3,000 people over time, over months and months and months, until he got someone who agreed to sell it in their shop. And he had a program where he said, look, you sell my chicken and just pay me a percentage of your increased chicken sales. Now his name was Colonel Harlan Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Literally Edison had to do thousands of experiments before he got the light to stay on. Of course he hit it with a bit of power and it would go, be gone. Now you don't do those sorts of things without hope. And we're meant to allow hope to grow in us. Say this with me. Hope is the oxygen that feeds my faith. If you, your faith is weak or you don't have faith, hope is where it starts. Hope is not as strong as faith, but it's the entrance way into faith. And When sin entered the world, disappointment entered the world. You imagine Eve. um, Eve has relationships with Adam and conceives a son and goes off somewhere to give birth to a son where no one had ever given birth and she gives birth to a son called Cain who murders his brother. When these things enter, hope gets destroyed. I, I just get amazed that people quote to me the statistics of how many women are killed every year in Australia by former partners or current partners. How many people have to live in fear of being brutalised by someone who's supposed to love them? God's not slack to fulfil his needs, but it's not impossible to think that Susie has waited years in hope for certain things that she's desired. And desire's just more than a want list. Desire's a fearsome thing. Why, Why is it? I was in a meeting once and in the meeting someone had a word for loneliness. And they, so whoever was leading the meeting said, could all the lonely people come forward? And I looked at this crowd of people and I thought, if they only turned sideways and shook each other's hand, they wouldn't be lonely anymore. But we become lonely and we become selective about who we'll share our life with. We'll become selective about um, choosing Uh, different places to work, different groups to socialise with and we'll exclude people. And I think a lot of the time we have our hearts really closed off to you, Mandy. See, often when we come to God, we we, we go through trials. As the devil puts up, uh, puts up obstacles to us. Meeting God. When I came to God and realised he had total control over my money and he wasn't broke, 
I was amazed. Tanya and I, Tanya and I wouldn't have thought before we were born again to pray for money. We just thought you had to do your best. You had to work harder, get a second job, do something. But that God could answer your prayers concerning money. And for many years, I used to walk around with a $50 note in my top pocket waiting for God to tell me to give it to someone. And I wanted to hold it with light fingers. And every time God told me to give it, he would replace the money within a day or so with more. I couldn't believe it. I was like, and so that broke something over me concerning the hope for God looking after my um, looking after my finances. In the Old Testament, the whole theme seems to be themes of longing and expectation. Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and far from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them who bless you and curse them that curse you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He and Sarah had been promised a son. But that hope deferred was missing for many years. They didn't have a son. So he's called Abram, which means exalted father. God comes and changes his name and puts a hurt in it. So he becomes Abraham, which means which means father of many nations. So he goes from being exalted father, having no son, to being father of many nations, having no son. And so they then devise a scheme in order to fulfil that prophetic word by saying, oh, he must mean use my young slave girl, Hagar. Hagar is the father, of, is the mother of Islam. So he didn't hear that right, did he? And what can happen is as you get further away from the promises of God, you decide that God needs a bit of a hand. Now, people say to Tanya and I all the time, well, what are you doing? Where's the church going? What are you doing? Well, I want to tell you what we're not doing. We're not sitting here doing nothing because we will make announcements as we go along because God's telling us to do certain things. We want to invite all who, all who listen to these videos on the internet, to, if you're in the area, to come. You're very welcome to come. Five o'clock on Sundays. Very welcome. The kettle will be on. We might have a few biscuits here. But you'd be welcome. Because a lot of you we haven't met or we haven't seen for a long time. And we'd like to see you. But we certainly, as a people who know God, are not going to sit here and watch sighing, dying humanity go down the drain hole. We're not going to do that. Because... We underwent extensive training and can train others how to help people, how to help them stand in faith. Paul in Romans 4 says, As is it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickened the dead and called those things which are not as if they were. Who against hope believed in Jesus that he might become the father of many nations according to what was spoken? So shall your seed be. And him being not weak in faith said, not weak in faith said, he didn't consider his own body. When God makes you a promise, you don't look at what your 
um, resources are. If God said you are to do something, then the resources and the capability will be gifted to you along your journey in doing it. I was um, um, many times Tanya and I travelled overseas, and uh, so we went and stayed with a poor tribe in Africa. We went to the Philippines and lived with people on a dump. Um, and we've been to many places and many places to be trained and many places where we've seen the hand of God move. We went to Africa because we felt we were meant to. And when we got to Africa, we were put in this, in this field which was a dump and they had like big stacks of tyres on fire. And um, we didn't know what we were going to do. There were hundreds of people there. And we had never, like, mass prayed for people. We, we weren't people who had big, long prayer lines, right? So we knelt down and asked God to help us. And in the prayer line, the first person, boy, boy we prayed with was deaf and dumb, and he spoke and heard. Now, you can't unsee that. You can't say that never happened. You can't unsee it. So, here am I uh, with... Um, Deteriorating, um, de- deteriorating eyesight, and the devil would mock me, say, "Where's your God now?" But I have hope because I've seen the blind see more than once. So the devil will mock you. He'll mock you, say, "Oh, look how many people! There's hardly anyone at church. Hardly any people." But let me tell you. Most churches that I know have suffered the last few years because people are disillusioned, because they've lost hope. And we've allowed fear to enter us. Fear has been fired at us every level of society. Fear to be in other people's company. Fear to go out without a mask on. Fear for this, fear for that. And these things have created an atmosphere by which the church has to stand. And it starts by you standing, by you saying, um, by you speaking to the mountains that attack you. By you saying, mountain, bow down before the name of Jesus. Every mountain shall bow. Every valley will be made low. I saw Bob and Mavorin looking for a house here where there were none. There were none in their price range and none that they liked and none that sort of fitted. But if you talk to them, they move in one this week. Because God has a way when he wants you to do something. He'll send um, people to help you. He'll cause, he'll cause the very hills to cry out. Remember, we're not here because it's convenient to us. I didn't go to a map, map with Tanya and say, oh, Lawson looks like a nice place to live. We'd never been here. We'd driven past on the highway. Tanya just happened to work with a girl who lived in our house. And they were moving out. And uh, it was told us it was owned by Catholic nuns and we approached them and got the place. Some people would have felt silly that we got the place because it didn't even have a working stove. It had a barbecue in the family room with that barbecue inside. <laughs> so, so we'd be barbecuing inside. So it wouldn't be like... It wouldn't be like the Clark family doing their uh, inspection of property. They'd have to just work out whether they could work that barbecue inside. It had, it had 17 sinks in the place and no heating. No insulation. But it was God's place. So what happens? God 
shows us how to buy it and the house now becomes our superannuation. So the church didn't have to pay our superannuation. God paid our superannuation. This is the wonder of the God we serve. The wonder of it. And so I want you to have some time to examine yourself where you've allowed hope to be quenched. To really come to God with a spirit of repentance and release that. Receive his forgiveness and receive some hope where you've lost it. People want you to have hope. And one of the things is when hope deferred makes the heart sick, I believe it's a big it's a big cause of heart disease, of sick hearts. And the other thing, as I was praying this week, it, it it's so it's so um, noticeable now when you go anywhere, you've got to fill in all these bits of paper. And then they'll get you to fill in your history. And um, so I don't go there and fill in my history and say father alcoholic, mother alcoholic. I don't fill all that. And I'm not looking to, for, to find those generational curses in myself. I look to have broken them and I've broken them. So I want to encourage you to start the to start to really go back to where you've started to, how do I put it, believe less, give less, expect less. Because in Hebrews 11 and 11, I came to the scripture verse, I came to the Lord on was Hebrews 11 11, which is the story of Sarah when she's told she was going to have a baby. And it said she laughed. And, you know, I, I, I can really understand that, that, um, that response. But it goes on to say in Hebrews 11, she said, looking at him who made the promise and seeing that he was faithful, she believed. So, beloved, God believes in you. We are responding to his belief in us. So he believes in you. I pray for you and I pray for the many and varied things that you all face. I pray for your money. I pray you'd have enough. I pray uh, that this hard times we go through wouldn't stop you giving to those who need it. You can't give, out give God. I pray for your health. I pray for this insidious invasion of fear that has come against us. We turn it back in the name of Jesus. I pray where your hope's been deferred. See, I know that our good friends Colin and Susie have a son who has been ill and uh, has not really responded. He has had a hard time. Now, when we have a son that's had a hard time, we're having a hard time too. Because he doesn't live in isolation. So I pray for him especially that he would have an outpouring upon his life. We push the demonic away from him in Jesus' name and we pray that as, as it says in the scripture that the eyes of his heart would be open. That the eyes of his heart would be open. I pray the blessings of God would overtake you like the ploughman overtakes the reaper. Amen.